What's up? Merite here. Let's talk about the anatomy of the central nervous system. In this segment, we will go through the base in understanding how the anatomy of the central nervous system is built. And to do that, we're first going to start by going through the parts of the central nervous system. Then we're going to go through the microscopic structures, basically understand what neurons and neuroglia are and how they're distributed in the central nervous system. After that, we will be talking about the distribution of white and gray matter and talk about nerve tracts and then end by talking about the general nervous system development. So the central nervous system consists of two main parts. There's the encephalon or the brain and the spinal cord. But the brain is further subdivided into functionally different parts. So if you look here, we have the spinal cord and then above the spinal cord, we'll find a structure called the brainstem. And the brainstem consists of the medulla or the medulla oblongata, the pons and the mesencephalon. And then behind the brainstem, we will find the cerebellum, which is an essential part of the brain for muscle memory. Above that, there's the diencephalon, which is the area you will find the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And then we have the telencephalon, which is what we call the highest order of the brain, where our personality is. And so the way all of this works is that neurons pass signals towards the higher senses of the brain. Then there are nerves that interpret the signal, which then generate an impulse, basically activating neurons that send signals towards a muscle or an organ to activate a response. And so I say neurons because that's the primary type of cells in our nervous system. If we take a segment of the spinal cord and look at it underneath the microscope, you will see that they're composed of nerve tissue. And if we take a small segment of the nerve tissue, you will find a lot of these cells we call a neuron. So let's talk about the neuron a little bit. Here we see a simple animated neuron. They consist of dendrites. Dendrites are what receive signals and then send them towards the cell body, which contains a nucleus, of course, since it's a cell. The signal are then sent through an axon, which are long fibers that can extend at a large distance. You even have nerves at your lower back that extend all the way to the tip of your toes, thanks to the length of the axon. And then at the end of the axon, there's the axon terminal, which uh, then connects with the dendrite of the next neuron to form a synapse. Now axons can sometimes be wrapped around by cells called Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes. If they're in the brain or the spinal cord, they're called oligodendrocytes. And if they're outside the central nervous system, they're called Schwann cells. These cells form a myelin sheath around each segment it covers. So axons can either be wrapped around in the myelin sheath or they can be free axons that aren't covered by any myelin sheath. And the good thing in having the myelin sheath around the axon is that it helps transmit the signals much more faster. And so this is how a general nerve impulse looks like. A signal is sent from one cell through the axon into the dendrite of the next cell, which then travels towards the cell body and then through the axon into the dendrite of the next neuron. So if you go back to this picture, you will now see the dendrites here, the cell body, and an axon going out from the cell body. And you'll study this more in histology, but the way you can differentiate a dendrite from an axon underneath the microscope is by looking at the granules within the neuron. The axon doesn't have these granules, and because of that, you can see a clear margin between the axon and the body, as you see here. And so, do all nerve cells look like this? The answer is no, unfortunately. Nerve cells are actually categorized by their shape. We have a multipolar neuron with one axon and many dendrites that give the cell a star-like shape. There are many of these cells that are widespread in the central nervous system. Then we have the pseudo-unipolar neuron. It's unipolar because the axon and the dendrite emerge from the same place from the cell body. And it's pseudo. Pseudo means false or fake. It's false because the signal still has to go through the cell body to reach the axon. That's why it's fake. It's not a straight line. It goes through the body and then through the axon. And we also have bipolar nerve cells where one axon and one dendrite emerge from either side of the cell body, as you see here. So nerve cells differ in structure depending on where you find them, but neurons also differ in function. There are three general functions a neuron can have. A nerve can either be afferent or sensory nerve, it can be an interneuron, or it can be an efferent or motor nerve. Let me give you a simplified example of how this works. Let's say you wake up in the morning and you see a coffee and you don't just see it, you also smell the coffee and you hear the sound of the coffee machine working. All of these neurons being stimulated will lead the signal towards the central nervous system as sensory neurons or efferent neurons. 
Then these signals are interpreted in your brain through interneurons. And suppose you've decided that you want the coffee. In that case, the brain is going to engage motor neurons or efferent neurons to activate muscles in order to pick up the coffee cup. So remember, afferent neurons arrive into the central nervous system. Efferent neurons, they exit the central nervous system. Okay, so we now understand what a neuron is, but you also need to visualize the fact that they're not alone in the central nervous system. There are many different types of cells we call neuroglia that give mechanical support and give nutrition and protection to the nerve cells, as you see here. And so we got many different types of neuroglia in the central nervous system. We got astrocytes, which are the largest neuroglia. These astrocytes have long projections that wrap around the blood vessels within the central nervous system, and they form the so-called blood-brain barrier. Then we have oligodendrocytes, which are responsible for myelination of the nerves in the central nervous system. Remember, in the peripheral nervous system, we have Schwann cells, and in the central nervous system, we have oligodendrocytes. So that's that one, forming a myelin sheath. We got microglia, which are the smallest neuroglia. These are basically the immune cells of the central nervous system. They can do everything a macrophage does, like phagocytosis, and they migrate between the tissue. And lastly, we have ependymal cells, which line all the cavities within the brain and the spinal cord. So that was the two main categories of cells in the central nervous system, neurons and neuroglia. But the tissue in our brain and spinal cord are divided as either white matter or gray matter. Gray matter is tissue rich in nerve cell bodies and dendrites. White matter is rich in myelinated axons and glia cells. And if you look at this neuron, in reality, the whole neuron is gray in color. They're all gray underneath the microscope without any significant staining. But the axons with myelin sheath around are white because they're so rich in lipids that they appear white underneath the microscope. So cell bodies and dendrites are gray matter and myelinated axons are white matter. And as we study the brain and the spinal cord, we often need to look at cross sections to study the tracts and nuclei within each segments of the spinal cord and the brain. In the spinal cord, you will find gray matter centrally and white matter around it. But in the brain, you will find gray matter at the external border. We call it the cerebral cortex. And you will also find gray matter at some places within the brain itself, called basal ganglia. Everywhere else is going to be white matter. So gray matter, cell bodies and dendrites, white matter, myelin and axons. Cool. Now, here is something you'll see a lot when you study the central nervous system anatomy. It's tracts, nerve tracts. Nerve tracts are bundles of axons that connect gray matter to gray matter, or fibers that connect nuclei to nuclei. So imagine a hand that either touches something, senses temperature, or get pinched. All of those will activate specific nerves that lead impulses towards the spinal cord, leading signals through specific places towards the spinal cord and the brain in order to understand what just happened and react to it. So what I want you to know is that in gray matter, we got nuclei, and in white matter, we got tracts. Now, there are certain ways to classify these tracts. You can either classify them as association fibers, connecting adjacent structures, commissural fibers, connecting one part of the brain to the other side, or projection fibers, leading tracts up and down the spinal cord. And I'll talk more about this when I talk about the internal structures of the cerebral hemispheres, because that's when this classification becomes relevant to you. But the most important thing to remember, which you will hear a lot about, are ascending tracts, leading sensory fibers, descending tracts, leading motor fibers, and indirect tracts that interconnects different parts of the brain. This is just another way to classify nerve tracts. So that's all I had about nerve tracts for now. Lastly, let's understand the principle of how the central nervous system is developed. Once you understand that, you will also understand why the central nervous system is built like it is and why the agents and structures often have the same function. So if you look at the real primitive brain, you will find that we have four humps at the time of fourth week after fertilization. And we call those, well, the first one is not a hump, but the spinal cord. Then we have the hindbrain, the midbrain, and then we have the forebrain or in Latin, rumbencephalon, mesencephalon, and prusencephalon. But during development, your brain changes drastically. So already during the fifth week, you will notice that these humps are starting to form shapes. You will see that the rumbencephalon and the prusencephalon are going to divide. 
the rhombencephalon divides into the myelencephalon and the metencephalon, where they later on become pons, cerebellum, and the medulla oblongata. The mesencephalon is just going to stay like that. It's called the midbrain. And then the prosencephalon will divide into the telencephalon and the diencephalon. And so this is what an adult brain looks like. The spinal cord is down here. And again, the medulla oblongata, pons, and the cerebellum are all formed by the myelencephalon and the metencephalon. The mesencephalon is a synonym for the midbrain since it doesn't divide. The diencephalon will become all the thalamus structures like the hypothalamus and the thalamus and the telencephalon is what we refer to as the cerebrum. So one thing you should remember is that the closer we are to the spinal cord, the more basic the functions are. And so down here at the hindbrain, they're responsible for simple functions. They're responsible for regulating the respiratory frequency when you're not thinking about it, the cardiac function, vasodilation and reflexes like vomit, coughing and sneezing, and even swallowing are considered a basic function. And if you have a deep thought about something or you decide to do a simple act, that's going to be your cerebral cortex giving order to the rest of the body. So this was an overview of how the central nervous system is distributed and its functions and development. So in the next video, we will be going through the detailed anatomy of the spinal cord. So if you find this video helpful, please put a like, share, comment, whatever you find convenient to you. See you next time.